My name is Elizabeth Agnew Cochran. I'm a professor of Catholic Studies and Theology at Duquesne University with a specialization in ethics. This video is the first in a series of conversations about what it means for autistic individuals to flourish and what assumptions need to be re-examined in order to create a more just society. I'm a Christian theologian, and my own views of what it means for humans to flourish are informed by that tradition. But the concept of flourishing is understood in different ways in multiple academic fields in the humanities and the sciences. In all of these fields, we can enrich and expand our views of what flourishing looks like by recognizing that neurodiversity is part of what it means to be human. The panelists who share their perspectives in this video, Sarah Scott Dietz, Joellen Marsh, Father Matthew Schneider, and Michelle Wright, approach the topic of flourishing by using their academic expertise to reflect on the nature of flourishing, their own experiences of neurodiversity, and their commitments to the Christian faith. I learned a lot from talking with these panelists, and I hope that you will as well. I wanted to start us off with talking about flourishing in general before we move to autistic flourishing in particular. And I'm aware that the language of flourishing is something that's understood in different ways in different contexts. And uh, I'm curious to what degree we have a common view of what flourishing is and what nuances there might be to the different lenses through which we view this topic and experiences that um, have led us to understand this term in particular ways. So can we start by talking in general about flourishing and what it means for a human being to flourish? If nobody else is going to go, I might try for a first stab. Uh, my, 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 a lot of my research is in moral theology. And in moral theology, you generally think of happiness kind of as that, or beatitude as that final end, that kind of being with God in heaven forever type, type thing. But human flourishing is kind of the end while we're still on this earth in our body, you know, embodied on this earth before, before death, before heaven. And so it is, it is kind of the end goal, but it's, and in that sense, it's a, it's a kind of, um, you know, full, you know, buffet or spectrum or however you want to describe it of the different goods. So like you have enough food to survive, you have, you have relationships, you have, you have, you have, you have work, you know, you have um, shelter and you have, you know, uh, a just moral living so that you have a clean conscience and things like that all kind of mixed into one in that sense. And so the combination of all those together would be living a full life, uh, you know, in this world, which we would call human flourishing. Yeah. Yeah. I think when I, when I saw this question or when I thought about the question, um, I, coming from a, a medical perspective, we talk a lot about failure to thrive and that's what we'll see. And, um, oh, this patient has failure to thrive, which a lot of times is, uh, a little bit multifactorial or intangible of they're just not doing well, you know, they're, they're losing weight they're or they're not gaining weight. Um, they're not eating. They're just not doing well. Um, and you see that in children, you see that in adults. And that kind of made me think about the other part of that too, is, you know, you can fix the, the physical parts of that. I can, I can give you food. I can fix your electrolyte imbalances. I can kind of medicate you, but there's, um, there's another level to it, which I think goes to, to your point of, of the, the rest of it is, um, if there isn't some social support, if there isn't a, um, uh, a sense of, of, purpose, especially for adults. When we talk about failure to thrive, a lot of times you'll see it in older adults when um, they've lost their uh, their ability to do the thing that made them feel like a person. Um, and they just sort of stop. And I think to work backwards then is to say that to thrive or to flourish would be the opposite of that, would be to have your physical needs met 
but also still have that um, those those intangibles, the social support and the sense of of meaning and purpose that drives you. Yeah, I think that fits in with what I thought of when I heard this question, which is really related to my work in public health and harm reduction around looking at social determinants of health and those things that we know if we create an environment that looks a certain way, people are more likely to be able to you know, do well in school. They're more likely to be able to have good relationships. They're more likely to be able to handle conflict well. They're more likely to have their physical health needs taken care of later on in life and less likely to develop certain physical illnesses. You know, when we look at adverse childhood experiences and those types of things, they have a major impact on health. And those, many of those things are social. And, and I think looking at flourishing, it's really about how can we provide the care and community and, you know, environment that allows for healing and for flourishing and that sense of purpose. Um, when, when I first started thinking about this question, I too went to, um, well, what naturally, what does it mean for someone to flourish? Um, you, you got your food, you've got your shelter, you've got your health and, um, all your natural needs being met. But I think it's interesting to hear a doctor, you know, talk about failure to thrive, having something to do with more than the physical, um, as a catechist and theologian, um, I, I really believe that it comes with how we're created and why we're created um, in the image and likeness of God. We're created for communion. We're created for um, relationship. Um, God himself is a relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it makes sense that if we're made in his image and likeness, it's not good for man to be alone. Um, and so there needs to be... Um, an acknowledgement that we are more than just a body, that we have a mind, that we have a soul, and all of those need to be addressed um, to reach our full potential. As, as we think about this understanding of what it means for human beings to flourish and understanding of flourishing that um, includes you know, physical health and well-being, and socially determined factors of uh, that contribute to our health and well-being, and that at the same time acknowledges the ways that um, people have something deeper to them, to what it means to be human, um, tied to being in God's image and likeness, uh, tied to possessing a soul. How how does this understanding of flourishing fit with what you might think if you were to think about what um, what it would mean for an autistic individual or for someone as an autistic individual to flourish. Um, is this answer basically the same? Does, does, does thinking about autism or an experience of neurodiversity shift or change the picture of flourishing that you just laid out, um, or add anything to it or invite us to look into it in a different way? I think I would answer that both yes and no in a way that uh, that it's really the same because flourishing is always you know human flourishing is always that 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 combination of goods, but I think like in that level kind of between where you didn't really explain well as I thought as well in the summary, but it still was a good summary. But like in that level of kind of like our social relationships with our family, friends, uh, spouses, whatever, and with uh, things like meaningful work. Uh, in that level of kind of like the psychological level, but not like dealing with it as a pathology, but dealing with it as like healthy parts of psychology. I think that autistic people in general are gonna value things a little bit differently in the sense that mm -hmm. I think we are gonna value the meaningful work higher and the social relationships lower. Not that we don't want any social relationships, but like for myself, I noticed that I, I value much more like the meaningful work. And I noticed talking to other autistics, that seems to be a common pattern uh, more than, than the, than the meaningful relationships where other people would do it otherwise. Like I think of something, you know, you just think of something like, let's say uh, this Friday, I arrange with some people I know here near Belmont and I say, Hey, let's, uh, let's play a game of Catan because they, they like to play Catan. I like to play Catan and things. And for a lot of people, the first thing in that kind of, hey, I'm meeting with friends to play Catan is the friends. Whereas for a lot of autistic people, the first thing is like the Catan in a sense. Mm 
And I think that there that that it's it's kind of our psychology emphasizes certain goods like that a little more. But I think the overall vision is the same, even with those slight variation in in how we would put the hierarchy of goods for ourselves. And that hierarchy can vary in other people too. This isn't just with autistic people because a lot of these things, you know, which one you value exactly more is going to vary in other people. There's going to be other people who put, yeah, meaningful work above social rela- above social relationships or value it more in social relationships, less like we do, however you want to, you know, you know, measure that. But I do think that there is uh, a sense that certain goods are valued more by us and certain goods are valued less by us as in general versus the, the neurotypical or general population. That's really interesting. And that the example of Catan is a really good specific example. Um, how, how does that fit with other people's experience? Does that resonate with you or? Yeah, I think it, it fits with the things that I would think about. I mean, in terms of flourishing just for everyone, I think being autistic has allowed me to see more how everyone's needs are different. You know, a lot of people have the things that they prioritize and you might say as a culture or neurotypical people or groups of people in general, that there are commonalities, but when you really dig into it, everyone has their own preferences and, and those things change throughout their life. So I think really, I think I had to learn how to figure out what people needed and how to interact with them on an individual basis. And so I kind of learned that all my life and it's allowed me to be able to say, okay, this person is clearly not getting what they need. They have substance use disorder, they're homeless, they're living in poverty, all of these things. And maybe the things that they're saying they want don't seem to make sense to me. But I know that really no one can tell someone what's best for them. The only person who can know what's best for you is you yourself. Other people might be able to give you education and information and the support to be able to make those decisions and to make decisions that are healthier for you, but it really has to come from you and it really comes from that individual. And so I think from the autistic perspective, looking at what are those things that are the differences for autistic people and how do we make it so that they have the things that they need to flourish? Mm Yeah. Definitely. And, and I see even just like, look at this panel, the, the autistic members tend to have jobs that are much more um, low on the pay scale, high on the meaningfulness, uh, for lack of a better description. <laughs> um, and I, I read a book um, by St. Therese of Lisieux. She's known as Little Flower. Um, and she, she uses garden imagery um, to answer the question in that, you know, the beauty of a garden is, is a diversity, that there's so many different kinds of flowers, so many colors, so many smells. Um, you know, when you look at creation, it, it only makes sense that there would be different kinds of people too. Um, my, my son and I like to go to the Natural History Museum and they have this wall with all different kinds of um, bugs. I don't really like bugs. But when I look at it and I see like the size differences and the shapes and the colors, every aspect of creation just screams to the creativity of God, the, the, the beauty and the differences. And, um, and then I started thinking about um, St. Paul's, um, you know, the different parts of the body, how we, the body has many different parts, but they all work together to, to function. Um, And when I think about, uh, you know, an autistic person or a neurotypical person and how they are flourishing, I think it's just living up to whatever potential is inside of them and creating the circumstances for them to um, be happy and healthy, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally. Um, I I don't think that every person is going to need the same thing, Um, but I don't know if that helps. <laughs> I, I just keep getting these images of the flowers and the bugs and the, and the, and the beauty of diversity um, and how we all need something different, right? But we all work together um, as a community, as a part of creation to reach that that flourishment. Yeah, I think that's that's a great analogy and image of the garden. <laughs> and I, I think that 
in, at the end of the day, yes, it's different, but no, it's not different. I think it's just different right. for every person, not necessarily because of a neurodiversity or, you know, anything else. It's just every person is going to need something slightly mm-hmm. different. And then initially I'm thinking, okay, well, if you go to, you know, I'll revert back to medicine, right. And say, okay, well, everyone has the same basic, like physiologic needs, right? Everyone, except that even isn't true. Um, And you look at something like trying to um, uh, treat thyroid disorder, right? So everyone needs thyroid, right? But how much they need is going to be different. And who feels comfortable at what level when we start checking, it's like, well, there's this wide range or, you know, anywhere from depending on your lab, you know, 0.6 to, you know, four or six or whatever is going to be a reasonable, normal range. Right. But some people, some patients, if they get to um, like one, they're most comfortable and other people are like, no, I can't be this. No, this is, this is not good. Look at my toes. This is not good. And they're happier if their TSH is sitting at two. And the, you know, there's no reason for that, except that they are the person that they are. So um, yes, it's, and I have to laugh when you say, oh, to hear a physician talking about like there being something more is I'm maybe not the most representative doctor for better or for worse, but for me, it's here's the lab. Here's like the, the numbers, here's the data, but this is my patient. And I have to look at both before I can understand how to move forward with them. And I think it's the same, regardless of whether autism is on their list of diagnoses or not. It's just another piece of information. How do they flourish? That's a whole different conversation. Oh, definitely. When I started, I wasn't implying that it wasn't like kind of personal in a way. My thought was more of like, there's certain tendencies that autistic people have more than other, more than other populations in that sense, because obviously, you know, each person is going to be different. And, you know, like, you know, myself as a Catholic priest, I probably value religion, you know, and the, 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 the spectrum of like the flourishing more than a lot of other autistic people. Uh, you know, like I, you know, in that sense, because, you know, my religion, my relationship with God, I prioritize more than others, but that's, you know, and within flourishing, there is, within an idea of flourishing, there's a realm for a, for a diversity in that where, you know, one person says, you know, this has, you know, uh, I'm giving this, you know, 90 points and the other person says I'm giving it 60 or something. That's, you know, that, you know, however many points you have to go around for, <laughs> for whatever, for the, for that. Like every, all the children get chocolate in their Easter basket, right? But they don't like the same kind of chocolate. So if I gave all of them <laughs> milk chocolate, then two of them would be like, what is this? Why are you giving this to me? And then the other two, the other one would be like, oh, oh this is perfect. They're not going to like the same thing, even if it's sort of the same. They have different values. So I'm trying to oh. sort of substitute the, the Oh, even different things. I, I, I once, I once said half jokingly online that I have two sisters who, who both live within, you know, relative close to my parents. And I said, if they were, if their husband had married, had married the opposite sister, it would, it would drive them nuts. And, and I didn't, and I thought I was saying on Twitter where nobody, almost nobody else in my family is there. And then my one brother-in-law responds, he's like, yep, for sure. <laughs> you know? So it's like, because, because it's, you know, and for them, it's not even that it's more just one, it, one and their husband are much more spontaneous. The other one's much more, we're going to plan things out. We're going to have like a very specific plan. And like, they already know what they're doing on August 3rd. And the other one has, it hasn't even crossed their mind what they're doing on August 3rd yet. <laughs> Just temperaments and things like that. So. I think the impediment is that the world is set up for neurotypical people. You know, so it isn't that there's like an impediment, like that's inherent in autism. It's inherent in like the world that if you don't fit a certain right, like box, then trying to scoosh yourself into it is problematic. And it's trying to figure out how to change. You really, I, I both as a neurodiverse individual and a parent of a non-neurotypical child I I think I want to just go and like change the world like immediately but like that doesn't work so it's a combination of trying to find ways to 
affect the systems and also give the individual the tools that they need. But, you know, it's not about the impediment being inherent to the person. It's the, you know, the environment. I, 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 think, I, I think. Go ahead. Um, uh, let me get back on my train of thought. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, I think when we're looking at a systems perspective and when we're thinking about, you know, what are we, what can we do to accommodate people, whether it's an autistic person or it's, you know, someone from a BIPOC community or it's, you know, whatever that kind of marginalization is, I think the thing that is easy to forget is by accommodating the person and getting better at accommodating a specific need, we're getting better at accommodating everyone. everyone. You know, yeah. when we, uh, like, Social security, that's one been one of the best things for black people, for elderly people, for all, you know, all kinds of populations, but it affects and benefits everyone. And so bringing that back to this isn't just about doing things that are better for autistics. It's about doing things that are going to have a positive benefit on everyone. But maybe autistics are the ones who are noticing that it's happening. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and one of the things I was thinking back on reflecting was just, you know, elementary school, middle school. There was a lot of situations where I got bullied or like, you know, I, I was kind of lonely where had I had a diagnosis back then, having the understanding we have back then, I think I would have faced a lot less obstacles. Although I think often you still like autistic, autistic young people, especially ones that are not diagnosed, will probably still face a lot of those same things, you know, uh, where, where it's like the students... I was talking to a teacher I had in elementary school a few a few weeks ago, and he said, yeah, like I would trip over students. And he realized that it was not intentional because I was just very clumsy. I'm still not like that well coordinated, but I'm sufficient to, you know, to to work an ordinary life and things. But I would just like trip over students and things like that. And people thought I was just the other students thought I was just being rude and mean, whereas he picked up, OK, this is not him being rude or mean. This is just him. uh you know, not, not having good court and having like, not just not good coordination, but exceptionally bad coordination. But at that point, there was no real diagnosis for that. You know, I had good grades, I had, you know, I, but that created a whole bunch of social issues that I think today, hopefully, uh, if I, if I was in school today, that would be overcome. But I think there still are a lot of things like that in those little things like that, where it's just, looking it's just being aware and then making the changes or helping the people there especially young like you know elementary school students probably don't understand you have to explain it to them uh so that they can so the, the accommodation or the help to flourishing can be can be given yeah i remember i remember in like um I, repeatedly in elementary school the whole look at look in my eyes when I'm talking mm -hmm. to you, look in my eyes when I'm talking to you. And I tried to explain over and over is if I'm looking in your eyes, I can't listen to you. I can't mm -hmm. listen when you're making me look in your eyes. Like I can't do that. And over time coming up with like, I'm going to look at their nose. I'm going to look at their forehead. I'm going to like come up ways like to, to make it look like I'm looking at them and looking back at it, the amount of energy that I had to spend to try right. and and explain that and also try to figure out like why why was i so disrespectful <laughs> like why why am i inherently like why is this this is this is a thing that i can't do but i should be able to do and what's wrong with me and um and and hope hopefully like now it, that would be better understood but that's the one that really sticks that's one of the ones that really sticks out to me is now i'm like well obviously but well you know. to, to live in that that uncomfortability to think there's something wrong with you like th that's that's what breaks my heart is that there's so much good out there and you're right that the system is designed for neurotypical individuals um and when we help the least of these you know if we want to look at scripture we end up helping everyone um in my um, training of future educators, I have a, um, a comic that has um, a picture of a, a school that has, you know, a bunch of snow and the janitors out there, you know, shovel, shoveling off the steps and there's a crowd of steps waiting to get into the building. And then there's a child in a wheelchair who's also waiting to go up the ramp. And, you know, she says, can you clear off the ramp? And the, um, the 
janitor says, you know, well, there's a lot of kids waiting to get up the stairs. Wait till I clear those off and then I'll then I'll clear off the ramp. And the little girl in the wheelchair says, well, if you clear off the ramp, then everybody can get in. You know, when we reach out and try to make things more accessible to the least of these, to those, um, we end up helping everyone. Um, and and I, I just think about audiobooks. You know, my, my grandfather had um, macular degeneration and he would wait for those tapes to come in so that he could listen to a book. Um, and, and it was only for the, the blind at that point in time. Now I get in the car and I'm listening to audiobooks. I'm listening to podcasts. You know, I'm doing the dishes. I'm going grocery shopping. It's made my life um, so much better, so much richer. Um, and yeah, I, when, when we look at the needs of those around us um, and we, again, work towards finding strengths, I think that that's a very important thing. This conversation explored different theological and scientific accounts of what it means for human beings to flourish, what it means for autistic human beings in particular to flourish, and what sorts of impediments interfere with flourishing. To hear more from our panelists about the ways that Christian churches can support autistic flourishing, I encourage you to watch for our next video, Autistic Flourishing and the Church. Thank you for joining us.